Hi everybody, this is Hydrologic Engineering for Monday the 25th of March, class number 30. Um, today you have homework uh, number 10 due, that is the watershed modeling assignment having to do with setting up HEC1 modeling and subdividing the watersheds. So have a look if you haven't already, that assignment's on Blackboard and I'm going to extend the submission deadline. Normally assignments are due before class, but this one I'm going to set to 5 p.m for Monday the 25th. Um, the lecture that we're gonna go through today uh, kind of compares and contrasts two closely related watershed models. Uh, you've already seen HEC1, and uh, closely related to that is a model called HEC HMS. And in a lot of ways, HEC HMS was developed to uh, be more user-friendly than HEC1. And um, if you ever set up HEC1 the old-fashioned way, you'd certainly appreciate the improvements that HEC HMS brings. Um, but since we're using a pre- and post-processor, namely WMS, um, it doesn't really matter quite so much to us the improvements that HEC HMS have developed. And in fact, uh, the results are almost identical, which I think uh, this lecture is going to illustrate that point to you. So. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, you can always reach out to me via email or call me on Teams. So let's get into it. So the watershed we're going to look at today is close in proximity to the watershed we looked at on Friday up near Barker's Ridge Road in Milton, West Virginia. And we're going to use that as an example, this Jenkins branch, as an example of two main things. First of all, how to set up a HEC HMS model, but then also how to compare it to HEC1. Because um, sometimes when you tell people that you're running a HEC1 model, they'll look at you like maybe you're using old technology, but that's simply not the case. Um, from a hydrologic perspective, the calculations are the same, whether you execute a model that's a HEC1 model or a HEC HMS, it's just HEC HMS is its own standalone software. Um, so I hope to illustrate uh, that point today is, is show you that you get the same flow rates whether you do it with HEC HMS or HEC1, uh, but for us to do a HEC HMS model, we have to open up a second software package, which I'll, I'll illustrate for you. Um, but to begin, let's start with WMS and identify the watershed that we're going to use for this illustration, Jenkins Branch. So like we do, we'll start with the hydrologic modeling wizard. And uh, I'm going to just browse to a location that you kind of especially want to be clear on where you're working today because we're going to have to open up these files with the external software, the uh, HEC HMS software. So I'm going to create a new subfolder, one that's called HMS model, and then later I'm going to have one that's called HMS export. So the model is the stuff that I'm creating with WMS. So this is Jenkins branch. All right, maybe this will be more like it. Let me delete this unnecessary soil data just to keep the system from getting too bogged down. The more that's there, it's just going to be using RAM if we've got a lot of unnecessary soil data shown. All right. Let's compute Topaz. Turn this off for now just so that I can drop my flow accumulation cell. the outlet here. Now I'm feeling shy about whether that's the right spot. I guess I better bring up the map just to make sure. Yeah, that's it. All right. 
fingers crossed now. Oh, man, just barely. Boy, oh boy. All right, so 1420 acres. This is a pretty big watershed. Um, all right, so some of the steps that were mentioned a few moments ago, we have to right click and join NRCS data. We're going to fill in the blank values with D just for a worst case scenario type coverage. And speaking of coverage, we need to create a new one, soil type coverage. All right, and select the uh, polygons that are inside of our watershed and copy them over into the soil type coverage. And we can see that it looks like we've mostly got type C soil in this watershed, a little bit of type A soil. So none of them are those assumed type D soils that we said that would fill in any blank spots. Okay, now that that's copied over into the soil type coverage, we can see them here because that's what's active in the map. I can switch that off. I mean, it's still able to do calculations with it. It's just maybe a little bit less visually distracting if it's uh, not displayed. We can go into um, the hydrologic modeling module and use the calculator to compute the uh, curve number. I need to import that text file that explains the relationship between land use, soil type, and curve numbers. And uh, it runs the calculations and gives us the composite curve number for this watershed, which I think is maybe around 68. 67.66. Okay. Now, if we wanted to do a HEC1 model, you can see by default it's assuming that's the, the, the model we're going to use. We would just double click on the icon and start filling in the data here. Uh, but instead, we're going to do HEC HMS. So I want to save my work up to this point just in case things crash so I can come back to it. So I'm going to click on save again. Okay, so all of the files that are associated with this project are right now in this subfolder HMS model, which I just created. And so we can see the soil type data is there, the WMS file, a few other things having to do with the land use, the soil type, and so on. Uh, Geo-referenced image. But instead of HEC1, pick the drop-down box, and we're going to choose HEC HMS. OK. Now, under the HEC HMS drop-down, we have job control, parameters, and meteorological parameters. So job control has to do with the timing of the model. Like, you have to tell it, if you're doing a simulation, when its simulation should start, when the simulation should end, and then um, at what frequency or what duration is like the, um, the time step calculations. And it can, be, it, the, the, it can be the actual date of some storm that you have rainfall data for. So like if you're doing a historical storm, you could say, I want my simulation to begin June 3rd, 1927 or you know whenever you have this rainfall data for it and whenever you're trying to simulate um, or it could just be more hypothetical then it doesn't matter so much the start date and time except for one thing the uh, the starting time and the ending time should match up so that uh, it's on the same time interval frequency that you're saying down here below. I, I ran into an error message earlier when I didn't have that matching. So let's say, for example, we wanted to go from 1215 and 00 seconds on April 11th until 1215 and 00 seconds on April 12th. And so this is going to be a 24-hour simulation with 15-minute time interval steps. OK. Um, we don't have to put anything into these tabs 
for the most basic kind of a model, but um, you could define things like snow melt, evapotranspiration, but we're not going to do that. We're just going to go with these default options, but we did adjust the, uh, the timing of the model. Okay, so that's the job control. Set that. Now here under edit parameters, we're going to define a few of the things that we would have told it in HEC 1 as well. It's just that there's a different name for it. Um, loss rate is where we're going to tell it what approach it should be used it should use to um, transfer between the rainfall depth and how much of that is rainfall excess. So, for example, we've used the NRCS method, which is based on curve numbers for our loss rate on all of the HEC1 models that we've done. So if you tick the box here for loss rate, then it gives you the option of choosing, you know, what approach you want to use for the loss rate method. So by default, it's assuming down here in this properties box that we're using SES curve number. So check that box for SES curve number. For transform, the transform is um, the temporal distribution of the rainfall excess. And so it's going from um, the depth of runoff to its occurrence over time. So the transform, in other words, is where you're telling it to use a unit hydrograph. And so we'll use the SCS unit hydrograph method for that. And so there's some fields in here that down in the properties we're going to have to calculate or specify in a minute. Um, and then finally, base flow is answering the question, do you want to account for water that was in the stream before this current storm event occurred? Um, so let's turn on base flow just so we don't get an error later on. But the default assumption is that there's no base flow to begin with. And so if we happen to know that there's 10 CFS in this channel before the storm, we could add it on in the simulation or we could just in our minds, once we've calculated the, the storms, peak runoff, we could add on any base flow that we know about on top of that. Okay, so we've specified those three options, and then down here in the properties box, let's check on what it's understanding about the SCS curve number. So it takes the 67.66 that we calculated earlier, and it automatically fills that in. Now, we don't specify a separate initial abstraction. You'll remember that the default assumption for initial abstraction is 20% of the storage. If you happen to have a really well calibrated watershed, you can tinker around with the actual initial abstraction. So there could be watersheds with just an enormous amount of leaf litter, and so the initial abstraction is more than 20% of the storage, where storage is based more on the soil properties, but initial abstraction is things that are above the soil. Um, so you could make adjustments to the initial abstraction, manual adjustments, but we're just going to stick with the default that's based on the curve number. Likewise, you could also specify the percent impervious in a watershed if you knew that there was a lot of roof areas or a lot of paved areas or um, things of that nature. In this rural watershed, it's almost entirely undeveloped or farmland, so there isn't any impervious area. Okay, so now we are in the uh, transform and um, the transform method of SCS is how we're going to determine the lag time. And so if we click basin data, we get the same dialog box we've seen on other occasions where we can choose from among all the different methods for calculating um, curve number, excuse me, calculating the time of concentration or lag time. Until now, we've just relied on the SCS method because we always have the curve number, watershed slope, and watershed length and because these watersheds are within the typical parameters for the SES lag time. So click OK and it fills in automatically the 0.74 hours that's assumed based on the SES method and remember no base flow. Okay, so any questions so far on the types of things we're defining for HMS? And by the way, I want to make an important point, and that is 
the button locations, I mean, that's going to change from version to version of the file. But what I really hope you take away from this class isn't so much um, like where to click in the program, but what I hope you take away is what sorts of things do we have to define in the program? You know, like what are the hydrology fundamentals that we know have to be satisfied to create a model? And how are we going to tell the program things like how much precipitation there is? the temporal distribution of the precipitation, what it should assume for the amount of infiltration or the rate of infiltration. I mean, those are the fundamentals that if you understand them um, and you know what sort of information you have to feed the computer, you can still go on the lookout for a particular window if you haven't yet defined a parameter. You know, like when you get an error message and it's an unfamiliar code, you know, error message 1408, you may not even have to look that up if you suddenly realize, oh, I didn't even specify a precipitation depth yet. So you just have to keep in mind, what does the computer need to be able to do a simulation? All right, so click OK. And back up here into the heck HMS, what we've done so far is define the job control and the parameters, but we haven't, speaking of precipitation, we haven't yet told it anything about the rainfall. And so we do that in the meteorological parameters. OK. So here, precip from web, if you click that, it'll use the location of our watershed to identify both the latitude, longitude, and let's do this as a 10-year storm. So we'll get the 24-hour storm duration, 10-year return period, click data, get data. Okay, so 3.602 inches is our midpoint estimate of the 10-year rainfall depth. Okay. And of course, this Hayito graph, XY series, is how we define from depth to the temporal distribution of that depth. This is the 24-hour depth, but we want to know when does it, during the 24 hours is this rainfall going to occur. And remember that the type 2 distribution, type 2 24-hour distribution, it's not that every storm has this period of intensity that's about 12 hours after the storm starts. It's not just like every storm in West Virginia has the intense part 12 hours after the rain begins. It's just that over thousands and thousands of storms, this is the distribution that is characteristic of the rainfall behavior in the state. So there can be some storms that maybe are even more intense where a greater fraction of the storm is in that same short period of time than is shown here. But this is an average distribution. Okay, so now we've got the depth and the timing of that depth over a 24-hour period is defined. Okay, so we click OK. Now we've defined at this point all of the uh, parameters that HMS needs to execute a model. But you'll see here there is no run simulation option. It's grayed out. We can't run the simulation from within WMS because um, HMS is its own program. It's not just a model. It's a, uh, a, a model processor and a hydrologic model. So what we're going to do is save the HMS file. So click on that and I've so far been working in HMS model subfolder. I'm going to create a new one just so that there's no confusion. Um, this I'm going to call HMS export. And so these are the things that I'm exporting from WMS and then I'm going to open up in the HMS program. So let me call this Jenkins since that's the name of the watershed. Save it. Now it's going to take a while because it's creating a lot of files in that subfolder. I'll browse to them to show you all the things that it's created. So HMS model is what we've been working in for WMS and HMS export is where we just saved a bunch of stuff. So what it copied over was um, a run .run file is telling HMS things like um, the starting time and the ending time of the simulation and how many steps there should be. The .met 
is the meteorological data. So that's where it's saying the depth of the storm, the 24-hour duration. Um, the dot MAP is kind of a shape of the watershed. So when we open up the program, when we open up HEC HMS, it's going to be reading a lot of these files simultaneously. Um, and I hope it works because uh, I tried this a couple of times this morning. One time it worked smoothly. The other time it didn't work smoothly, I guess would be an understatement. And I had to uh, manually import each of these individual components rather than it automatically opening everything at the same time. Now, let me just give you an idea. If you're interested in downloading HEC HMS, it's free and you're not going to have to fight with any kind of license activation. So you can get it. You don't have to get it now, although it does install pretty quickly, a lot faster than WMS does. HEC HMS download. And another nice thing about HEC HMS is that it gives you the option of either the Windows version or a portable version. My suggestion would be to go with the current version rather than the beta. But these two different options here, this is going to be installed on your machine and you have to have um, administrator rights. But a couple of you are borrowing a computer from the library and so you'd have to go over there to install it. If you don't want to do that, you can use this portable version. And so it's not actually installing the software, but it can just execute it without installing it. Similar, I think there was a similar option with HY8, where there was a standalone, but then there was a portable um, executable that doesn't have to be installed. So I wanted to point that out. So it, it downloads and installs pretty quickly, uh, but most of you I don't think are going to have that right yet. So this is the program. And what I'm going to do is just try and open up, browse to the location of that, what do they call it, HMS export. So let's browse on my C drive temporary folder to HMS export. And here's Jenkins.HMS. Now fingers crossed, if this works, what it'll do is it'll open up, okay, first of all, what WMS is exporting it to is version 4.41 of the program and this is just saying do you want to convert it to version 4.9 of HMS so let's convert it so that's really our only option besides cancel and it looks like it did import all of the components that I was hoping it would because over here on the left side um, that looks familiar you know the, the shape of our watershed is familiar from before and it gives us some new symbology where there's a watershed connected to an outlet. WMS does the same thing when it comes to kind of a, uh, a, a symbol of representing a basin and an outlet. Okay, so that's a common way of displaying it. Okay, if we look at the meteorological models you can see it's that 3.60 inches that we told it about when we were working in WMS has been exported over along with the type 2 24-hour distribution. Um, well, I'm just wondering on these basin characteristics. All right, so it knows the area in miles. You can see that the uh, SES curve number is defined for the loss method. The transform is the SES unit hydrograph. So those are the things that we defined previously. Loss, 67.67 is the cur uh, curve number. Transform, we have the lag time that we've calculated previously. So these basin characteristics were all defined from WMS. And we could, we could do it in HEC HMS, but if you want to spend a little time outside of class going, going through the tools that are here, um, I don't think it has quite the same capacity to go get the soil data for you and automatically calculate the curve number. So it would probably take some additional time to, to calculate the curve number and to get the precipitation data. Although you can get the precipitation data just from the website. You know, that's not the end of the world. But it's not click it and it gets copied in. 
Let's double check the uh, control specifications because we want to make sure the timing here. So 12.15 to 12.15. Um, if it is not on 15 minute increments but our time interval is 15 minute increments, then that could be an error that we might get. Okay, we don't need to uh, do anything with this time series data. Um, okay, so it's ready to go, ready to execute the model. Um, we need to create a simulation run. So if we didn't already have one, here run one is already defined, but we need to right click on it and have it compute. Okay, 100% it finished computing the run. Now, one place where I will acknowledge that HECHMS does a pretty nice job is the reports that it gives you. If you look in the results, it has some pretty nice reports. So if we click on the simulation report, uh, simulation run one, it's got this summary of the peak discharge. So I'm going to write this down on the whiteboard here. It says that our Q peak is 502.4 CFS. 502.4 CFS. All right. So the reason why I write that on the board is just because we're going to pull it up and run a, a HEC1 model in WMS to see if it is hydrologically the same. Um, okay. Let's see. Yeah, so let's look at the basin. So clicking on 1B, which is the basin, it's got um, a nice hydrograph as well as the rainfall hydrograph. So here is above it the, uh, the rainfall then here's the result of the rainfall excess, so our runoff hydrograph. So that's pretty nice. You can print it. You can edit the graph properties in a way that maybe isn't quite as simple in WMS to uh, change colors of the hydrograph and so on. Um, the summary table, we've seen that already, but the uh, Here's the, the spreadsheet data that shows how much precipitation at each one of these 15 minute time increments there's been, how much of it is infiltrated, how much rainfall excess there is, and the runoff. So these reports are pretty nice. We've got different ways of just visualizing the results of the model. And uh, so that's HMS, in a nutshell, how you can set up a model. Now the question is, how does it compare to if we had run this as a HEC1 model? HEC1 is older than HEC HMS. Um, you know, back maybe until 15 or 20 years ago, um, the Army Corps of Engineers didn't have its own software for running hydrologic models. Then they developed HEC HMS and it's been improving ever since. Um, and when they did, they decided to just rewrite the code for the underlying hydrology engine since HEC1 uh, HEC was written, I think, with Fortran, which was kind of an old computer language that is a little bit clumsy. They converted all of the same basics into new code with HECHMS. So let me switch this over to HEC1 and let's see if we can define the model. So our precipitation Basin average, 3.6, it knows from before, but we need to make sure that we define the series as type, 20, uh, type 2, 24 hour, okay? So that's all set. Loss method, it knows the curve number from when we were calculating before. Unit hydrograph is defined, okay. So all the parameters are there. Let's run the simulation in HEC1 and see if it's about the same 500 CFS peak flow. Okay, it's done. And we'll open up the hydrograph. 500.74. So, you know, obviously that's just, you know, a round off issue where, um, I, don't, I don't know why, just maybe the, the different ways that it's slicing time probably, you know, point 15 minute increments, um, you know, it's as a percentage less than 
0.1% different between HEC1 and HEC HMS. But um, yeah, that's basically all, all I wanted to illustrate for you is that uh, if you do find yourself in a work environment over at the core or someplace else where you're expected to create HEC HMS models, you can, you know, if, if you want to use HEC, HEC HMS, you can, but um, it may be to your benefit to integrate the two, to toggle back and forth between WMS and HEC HMS. And in fact, once you have a HEC HMS model, um, within WMS, if I just switch back over here to HEC HMS, you can read a solution so that you know the uh, the result of the run one that we just did in HMS was the HMS export. So the solution that we got after running the model, this dot SOL, you could import it into WMS and so the only thing that WMS doesn't do is execute the model itself. It can be a, a pre-processor and a post-processor but it won't do the calculations from within WMS. Any questions about HEC HMS or how to set up a model in WMS that you could open in HMS? Alright, well that's all I have for you today.